from WXOJLP Northampton, 103.3 FM, your Valley Free Radio Station. Welcome. I'm Warren Odess Gillette, and this is A Baha'i Perspective. <music> Welcome to a Baha'i Perspective. I recorded an interview with Hussein Adier on June 15, 2020. I've had the wonderful opportunity to interview Hussein Adier a number of times whenever he produces a new work, and this is no exception. Hussein, in collaboration with Hilary Chapman, created the book The Chosen Path, Tahare of Persia and Her Search for God, targeted for young adults. We talk extensively about the history of Tahereh in Persia in the 19th century and her impact today. In the interview, Hussein refers to a number of what are referred to as Orientalists. Some of them were scholarly historians in the 19th century that focused their endeavors in researching the Persian culture, and others had less academic credentials but had directly experienced the Persian culture and wrote about it. These quote-unquote Orientalists discover the eventful history of the Babi faith and its renowned heroine, Tahereh, and wrote about her, thus introducing the Babi movement to the Western world. The Orientalists Hussein refers to in the interview are Alphonse Louis-Marie Nicholas, who was a Persian-born French historian and Orientalist, Edward Granville Brown, who was a British Orientalist and spent time in Persia, Joseph Arthur de Gabonot, a French diplomat who lived in Persia, and Lord George Curzon, a British statesman who had spent time and wrote about Persia. I started the interview by asking Hussein to tell us about Tahereh. Tahereh was a very charming and very colorful young woman. I would try to describe her the way we describe her for the younger people, because the book that I have written recently about her really described Tahere as a young girl who married at the age of 14 to her cousin. So the language of the book and the way she is described and who she is, is really for the young adult. So that's I want to emphasize, because... As you know, I have written another book about Tahereh called The Calling. And I think we had the interview about that some time ago. But on this one, I try to present Tahereh, describe her family, her parents, her father, her mother. The way I presented her is that she was a very unusual child. Her father uh, was very much in love with her, but he would often mentioned that I wish this girl was a boy. Mm. If he was a boy, he would replace me and would be a great religious leader in the country. But even though she did not necessarily become a great religious leader, her fame and her contribution become worldwide. And her non-traditional lifestyle, her study of religious subjects, her writing, her poetry, and her independent thinking and searching for the truth, these were all the kind of things that describe this unusual and unique woman. Edward Brown, the famous scholar and orientalist, uh, has written that the Bobby dispensation, uh, if they didn't have any other proof for their validity, just simply because they had Tahere as a follower was sufficient to prove that it was a divine origin and it was a valid and good fate. So what time in history did Tahereh live? It's very interesting that at the middle of 19th century, there was a major intellectual, social, industrial, and religious movement, both on the East and on the West. In the West, I'm sure you're familiar, all the changes was happening and all the philosophers and radical movement started, Karl Marx in Europe, and then some of the evangelists and ministers in America, 
the expecting coming of Jesus and, and all that. In the East, there were also this movement was making its impact, and Tahereh was living right at the midst of all that changes. And uh, her life span was really started from 1817 and run all the way to 1852 when they killed her. And what is her story? The story of Tahere is, is perhaps is the most colorful story. I'm 100% sure sooner or later they're going to make a major Hollywood movie about it. A young woman born in a traditional Islamic house, a marriage is arranged for her. She has three children from the marriage. All of a sudden, she discovers a new school of thought that we call it Sheikhi, and then later on, Bobby Fate. And this completely changed the direction of her life. She became a follower of this new, what we call it, Bob, who was the prophet of God. And even the way she accepted this religion is interesting. She had the dream, and this she has written about it herself. She had the dream, and this young, handsome Sayyid. Sayyid is a descendant of Prophet Muhammad in a black cloak and a green turban, a high above the sky, was reciting some poetry and some verses. And she got up and she remembered and she wrote those few lines that she dreamed about. Soon after, she received information or a text of one of the book of the Bab, and she found the exact quotes that she had dreamed of in those books. This confirmed her belief, and she asked Bob to accept her as one of his followers. And uh, Bob accepted her, and she is the only woman out of 18 early follower apostle of the Bob. Then, of course, she began teaching all over. She went to Karbala in Iraq, and she conducted classes for all the learned students and others. She was attacked. Eventually, she was forced to return back to Persia, and she traveled from city to city, and a whole group of her followers, they follow her from town to town. Eventually, after, I think, two years of not being in the Azvin, her hometown, she returned back. Family and relative, of course, they were against her very much, and especially her uncle, who was a great mullah, great mushtahed, another ayatollah. He attacked her very severely. Unfortunately, somebody killed this uncle, and Tahiri got the blame for the killing of this old man. She was put in the house arrest and was facing, actually, the execution herself. But with the help of other people, including a man by the name Janab Baha, that later on is known as Baha'u'llah, she escaped Qazvin. She went to Tehran, that was the capital of Persia at that time, and eventually attended a major conference called Badash Conference. And this is where actually her fame comes, because for the first time in that part of the world, a woman removed her veil from her face. And this was such a radical step on her behalf. She continued teaching and continued traveling all over the country. Meanwhile, of course, the governmental agent and soldiers were after her. Eventually, they captured her. They brought her to Tehran. They put her again under house arrest. And at some point later, they execute her by putting a scarf around her neck and suffocating her. I'm speaking with Hussein Adieh. He has co-authored a book called The Chosen Path, Tahare of Persia and Her Search for God. And so just for a little background for folks who aren't familiar with the Baha'i faith, the Bab, who Hussein referred to, is the prophet herald to the Baha'i faith, who was, uh, the Baha'is believe, a messenger of God in his own right, and in 1844 declared himself as that messenger of God, fulfilling the prophecies of the Quran and Muhammad. And as a result, the country of Persia went into an uproar because of such teachings being presented and so many people following this new messenger of God, the Bab, 
from all walks of life, including Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, who Hussein mentions helped Tahereh in her time of trouble when she was under house arrest, accused for murder of her uncle. Tahereh, she was born in an era in which she shouldn't have been born because she was so audacious a person and courageous a person that didn't fit the mold of a woman during that time of in history in Persia. That's very true. Actually, again, I don't know if you remember, but the earlier book that I wrote about Tahereh, uh, the title of the book was Tahereh and Her Contemporary American Woman. Toward the end of that book, I have collected testimony and the writing of major historian and major newspaper and scholars and what they wrote about her. It's very unusual at the middle of 19th century, people like Professor Brown, like Nicholas, like Gobino, like Lord Corzon, and whole group of other writers and scholars were so much in love with this woman and her work and her poetry. And of course, later on, you come across people like Iqbal in Indian Pakistan. Iqbal was the most famous Indian Pakistanese poet. This attention that they have given her to a woman born in Persia is extraordinary. It reflects actually not only her uh, personality, but unbelievable quality that this female had. To give an example of the constrictions under which Tahereh had to live by being a woman was that she was very versed in the Quran, and her, her father was very supportive of her participating in discussions with other men on the subjects of the Quran and other Islamic tr traditions. But for her to participate, she had to stand behind a curtain. That's because... true. Actually, she had memorized Quran by heart. It's amazing that they said sometime in the audience of her lecture were some of leading young scholars. There was one occasion, for example, those who are familiar with the Babi and Baha'i history, there was occasion that Vahid was present. And Vahid was a great scholar, began to talk about some complicated religious subjects and tradition of Islam. So Tahereh was the one who corrected him. And he also told him that the time for all this uh, talk and talk and talk is over. It's time for action. The woman really remind me of Joan of Arc, for example. Or she wanted to dress as a man and join the Fort Tabarsi's battle. She would ride horses to escape Qazvin and later on travel from place to place. She argued in argument with Qudus, uh, another leading Bobby at the time, about the different subject of the Bobby teaching. So it's hard for me, even that I'm familiar with, have to imagine that this, I should say, assertive woman was living in the middle of 19th century in such a backward country like Persia. And the Shah had heard of her, correct? That's very true. Her fame and especially her poetry was already popular in Persia. And the Shah knew about her. And they said, this, we are not sure that it happened or not, but the Shah proposed to marry her and ask her to, if you recant your fate, we could marry and you become my favorite wives. I think he had a whole bunch of them. In the answer of his proposal, she wrote a few lines of beautiful poetry. Let me see how it goes in English. He said, you and your crown, behold to it. Me and my poverty and my wandering dervish life, leave it alone. If you are happy with what you got, let it be. But also let me be what I am. So this was her answer to a marriage proposal by the Shah. I'm speaking with Hussein Adie. He has co-authored the book, The Chosen Path, Tahereh of Persia and Her Search for God. And I should mention that Hussein has co-authored this book with Hillary Chapman. Just before Tahereh was strangled, executed, 
what did she say? What did she proclaim yeah. when, just before that happened? I think this is the report of Nicholas or another Western observer. I don't think so necessarily was present at the time of her execution, but most likely he had interviewed the people who were involved in her execution. The word that she said to them was that you may kill me and you may destroy me, but you will not be able to stop and destroy the equality of man and woman and liberation of our gender, something in this effect. Mm -hmm. And that has been quoted very often by Baha'i and non-Baha'i historian as a, a statement that goes with her life. Often I, I have heard this even from my non-Baha'i friends. You had chosen to write this book targeted toward young adults. Why did you and Hillary Chapman do that? I have five grandchildren. Three, four of them are junior youth. Historically, even myself, I had such a difficult time as a teacher and as a speaker to deal with the junior youth because they were not patient, they were not mature enough to sit and listen, and they were so much in their own games and their own bullying and all this and that. So by the wisdom of the University House of Justice, about 10 years ago, direction came that there should be serious emphasis on the life and the work of the junior youth. And it should be a way that it would empower this group of people who are not kids anymore to try to save them and try to make something out of them. And they organized serious activity for this group. They trying to get them involved in the service project. They trying to create friendship among them. We trying to learn how to pray together. And the number of books and material has been prepared for them to spiritually empower them and to build their capacity. And often they are trained and they are helped by the older youth. One thing they do, which is very interesting, and I notice in my own grandchildren, two of them, is that the power of expression, the way they express themselves, the way they articulate their ideas is quite mature and different from what they used to be. Mm -hmm. These are really the group of young adult or the junior youth that we are dealing with, the kid from age 11 to 14 we are talking about. Mm -hmm. And there is not much material available for that age group. There is a whole bunch of books written for children. There are lots of books written for the adult. And there are some books even written for the youth. But when you come to junior youth, that kids from age 11 to 14, who they are molding their ideas, their personality, we don't have that. So Hillary and I thought it would be very good to introduce Tahere as a role model to this group of kids. That's why we decided to do that. So I'm speaking with Hussein Adieh, who co-authored the book, The Chosen Path, Tahereh of Persia and Her Search for God, with Hillary Chapman. Now, what was it that got you two together to write this book? Hillary Chapman is a grandson of Leroy Iwas, who was the wonderful hand of a cause and really the right hand of the Shoghi Effendi. The hand of a cause, a group of individuals appointed by Shoghi Effendi, who was the guardian of the Baha'i faith. And these people were playing a major leadership role during his life and after his death. And one of those people who was elected was this Hillary Chapman grandfather, Lore Iwas. I love this man. And it was our interaction before that was just, he was a member of New York Assembly, secretary actually, and I was a member of community. So we had our encounter one day very casually we were sitting at the lobby of the Baha'i Center, of New York Baha'i Center. And I think he mentioned that your ancestors and your family background in Iran is very colorful, you know, as I think I have mentioned before in one of our interview, that many of my ancestors were Bobbies and many of them were put to death because of their belief. And so Hillary and I decided to write a book about Wahid and my family and what happened in Nairis. It's called Awakening and was published by Baha'i Publishing Trust and translated to six different languages at this point. 
So this gives us some idea, and we began to write many other books together. We, I wrote a book about the school that I helped to form called Holland Preparatory School in 1960s with all the wonderful thing that was happening in America, uh, a group of us, Baha'is and uh, Christian ministers and black leaders and Catholic nuns, we got together and we opened a school called Holland Prep. Focus and the purpose was to place the black and the Spanish kid at university after they stayed with us for one year. Then we wrote a book about Abdul Baha's visit to America. Abdul Baha being the son of the founder of Baha'i Faith. He was a very colorful person who came to this country in 1912 and he traveled extensively all over the place and gave many talks in churches, synagogues, mosques, and other places. The American Baha'i community look up to him. Sometimes they even refer to him as a, another prophet, but he constantly would remind them and remind the non-Baha'is that he is not a prophet, but he is Abdul Baha, meaning the servant of Baha. He was an extremely humble man. His picture actually shows his humility uh, when you look at him. Then I wrote another book recently called Foreigner, which is a, a story of the Baha'is in Iran who are persecuted for the last century or so. And they were foreign in their own country. And then individual like myself escaped the country, came to America or Australia or Europe, but we still stay a foreigner. So we were foreigner in our own home and we became foreigner in America. But then I also show in the book that this pushing out of Baha'is and others from the native land, how wonderful it was for them. If I would have stayed in my village of Niriz in southern Iran, most likely I would be a very rich shepherd or landowner. I would have a couple of hundred goats and lamb and all that. But then we were forced to leave the country, and by coming to America and by relying on the power of faith, we made it. Really, I look at lots of my colleagues and friends, and I look at their children, how successful they become. And it's all because of their beliefs and their reliance on God. So I'm speaking with Hussein Adieh. He co-authored the book, The Chosen Path, Tahare of Persia and Her Search for God. And he co-authored that with Hilary Chapman. We were just speaking about all of the other books that Hussein has written over the years, ending with his most recent one called Foreigner. So back to this book, Tahare, which we were describing what a dynamic figure she was in the mid-1800s during the Babi dispensation, which we had described to folks earlier. Now, you could have chosen a number of titles for this book about Tahare. Why did you pick on the title, The Chosen Path? I really think it was inspiration. Neither Hillary or I don't remember that. And I even asked him at some point, how did they come up with this title? He didn't remember. I don't remember. <laughs> but I have a feeling it was the way that Tahare was so different from her other family member, the way she was so different from the rest of society, the other woman, and the way she act and she pursue her dream, I think it shows that this is the path that she picked up. It was not the usual path that the traditional Persian woman would follow. It was a unique, it was unusual, and I remember at some point we came across this phrase. I don't know, is it from her or from Abdul Baha or from someone? That this is my path and I know of my destination. So I think that she knew, she picked up this path and she knew that it's going to where she, she's going to end. And in many of her poetry, actually she, refer, she mentioned that she anticipated that eventually she would give her life for her belief. And this, I think, the, this chosen path and searching for God, this is really applied to this young woman's life. Even though she was associated with this Babi religion that underwent severe persecution 
she still became a renowned poetess in Persia during that time? I'm so impressed with this woman. Amazing that they have written about the way she was conducting her lecture and talk. But her amazing memory of remembering Quran and tradition of Islam and many of poetry of others, she would start a lecture. And at the middle of her lecture, she began to recite some poetry. Sometimes this poetry belonged to some other writers and other poets. And then as she goes along, because of her talent and ability, she would add a few lines to the things. So what happened is that some of her poetry that has been published is really a combination of somebody else's work and what she has added. But thanks God, Baha'i scholar and non-Baha'i scholar, they were figured out and they have separated. And the new anthologies that are published just shows her work. I selected one of her poets to read to you, if you want me. It's quite colorful and interesting. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. This particular poetry, it was translated by Professor Amin Banani and Professor Kessler of University of California. They wrote the book together. They called Tahere, A Portrait in Poetry by Kalamad Press. And the title of the poem is Point by point, if I meet you face to face, I would retrace, erase my heartbreak, pain by pain, ache by ache, word by word, point by point. In search of you, just your face, I roam through the streets, lost in disgrace, house to house, lane to lane, place to place, door to door. My heart hopeless, broken, crushed. I heard it pound till blood gushed from me, fountain by fountain, stream by stream, river by river, sea by sea. The garden of your lips, your cheeks, your perfume hair, I wander there bloom to bloom, rose to rose, petal to petal, scent to scent. Your eyebrow, your eyes, and the mole on your face, somehow they tie me trade to trade, kindness to kindness, passion to passion, love to love. While I grieve with love, your love, I will reveal the fabric of my soul, stitch by stitch, thread by thread, wrap by wrap, woof by woof. Last I, Tahere, search my heart, I look line by line, what did I find? You and you, you and you, you and you. Beautiful. I think this is beautiful. I do too. I'm speaking with this. Hussein Adie. He's the co-author of the book, The Chosen Path, Tahare of Persia and Her Search for God. He co-authored the book with Hilary Chapman. And he just recited a poem by Tahare, which was quite amazing. I've never heard a poem like that. We've been talking about how Tahare was a charismatic and influential person in her own right in this era of mid-19th century Persia. How would you say she had influenced the uh, Persian society at that time? They tried so hard, even her own family, uh, Warren, to destroy her name and not to allow really her poetry or her lectures or writing to be available to public. So for some time after her death, it was a taboo to mention her name in anywhere or to talk about her, except of course among the Baha'is who loved her. But then later on, especially with discovery of Western observer and Orientalist and scholars, her name, I would say in 1860s, 70s and 80s became a household name. Some of the Orientalists that helped her to become so well-known, I think I mentioned their name, Gobino was one of them, Nicholas was another one, Professor Brown was one, and then Lord Curzon was another one. At the end of one of my books, I have quoted many of them, even newspaper and magazine. And some of this work that the Western scholar has done has been translated 
to the Persian language and was available. But unfortunately, the local papers and local books in Persia in throughout 19th century, either they ignore her or they try to defame her and try to really destroy her innocence and her beliefs. And her own family, I think, also helped that because they didn't want to be part of that. Her influence really became more well known in, I would say, later century and writing of the Baha'i and non-Baha'i scholars about her. Though more influence external to Iran than internally to Iran. Exactly. And you know, some, you know, they even compare her, I remember at some point, they were comparing her with Mary Magdalene. It seemed that in every religion, past and present, there was always a unique woman. In Islam, they refer to Fatima, the daughter yeah. of Prophet Muhammad. In mm-hmm. Christianity, we talk about Mary Magdalene. In Bobby Faith, I think we talk about Tahereh. Mm. These are the unique personality that appear when the new prophet come to the picture. Hussein, would you like to read an excerpt from the book? I have a wonderful assistant, Tatiana Jordan, which you talked to her earlier. I need to take a short break. I'll let her read the thing that I was hoping to read. Do okay. you mind? No, not at I all. Get... Hi, Warren. I will read prologue of the book. The Chosen Path, Tahrir of Persia, and Her Search for God. Thank you. Do you have dreams? What if you had a dream that was telling you something important? Would you believe it? What if anyone else disagree with what you believe? This is what happened to the young lady in this story. She had studied the holy books of the past and had come to understand on her own how God was truly working in the world. She believed God was speaking again, this time to a young merchant who claimed that he was the messenger of God. But very, very few people agree with her. Most of her family, several of them, were even very angry with her. This young woman, though, had confidence in her own thoughts. She used the intelligence God had given her and the education her family had provided her. When she tried to speak out about these new ideas, she faced another huge challenge. She was a woman. Only men were allowed to speak and teach in public. Still, she persisted. She spoke in public from behind the curtain when men were present. Everywhere she went, she challenged powerful men to debates. She even stood up to the king and his ministers. What do you think happened to her? Do you think she succeeded? Thank you so much. We had just heard an excerpt from the prologue from the book, The Chosen Path, Tahre of Persia and her Search for God, co-authored by Hussein Adieh and Hilary Chapman, and Tatiana Jordan had just read an excerpt from the prologue. So, Hussein, where can people find your book? It's very much available on Amazon and other. It will be available very soon at the Baha'i Bookstore. We have a website and all that. They can go to and get more information. Tahere, the pure one, dot com. Well, you know, it's always a pleasure, Hussein, to talk with you with every Please. new work that you put out, <laughs> and this is no exception. Thank you so much for sharing with us your new book, The Chosen Path, Tahere of Persia, and her search for God. Thank you so much, Hussein. Sure. Thank you, Warren, for really giving me this opportunity to talk about this humble work that we have done. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Hussein Adieh, co-author of the young adult book entitled The Chosen Path, Tahereh of Persia and Her Search for God, with Hilary Chapman. You can find this interview and other interviews on the website abahaiperspective.com and on the YouTube channel A Baha'i Perspective. For information specifically on the Baha'i faith, you can go to the website baha'i.org 
or you can call the number 1-800-22-UNITE. I hope you join me next time on A Baha'i Perspective.
not famous Think that no one will blame us Letting injustice go on as it does But the starving don't care About the price of your haircut Any true kindness will do Because Bono can't change the world Anymore Voices and hands do more than any commands could Reviving the spirits of all who surround you And Bono can't change the world Any more than you two can Bring us Carl and Pearls Good woman and your loving Seems to be bonded together by love. So, if your little union should seem rather puny, understand that it's right at the heart of creation. Bono can't change the world anymore. Focus on services, the only ticket to peace It makes the gravest of worries seem the briefest of flurries Sure to be carried away on the breezes And Bono can't change the world anymore that Bono can't change the world anymore Struggle. 
travel ye and strive and hear and ponder the counsels of God. Let us fling away our lives and renounce our grief and number day.
This is WXOJLP Northampton, 103.3 FM, your Valley Free Radio station, streaming at www.valleyfreeradio.org.